Alrighty. What a great venue, eh? Yeah. Look at this. And Wanaka. <laughs> if I could live anywhere in New Zealand, it would be Wanaka. This is amazing. You can do it. I can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, manhood. Um, I've personally been a man for like 20 years now. <laughs> Give or take a decade. And uh, most of the time, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. I'm just kind of faking it. You know, waiting for uh, to be caught out and exposed as a as a an imposter. <laughs> but um, luckily, as a man, I do have my secret and unspoken rules of manhood to help you know guide me through the wilderness of manhood. Namely, that well, I'm a lone ranger. I spend my life behind my mask, and I never really share my story with anyone. I don't ask for directions, and I don't ask for help because I'm an island. You know, it's all very manly. Um, <laughs> So I applied these rules to, of manhood to my life, and it turns out that um, they're really fucking shit. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> Anyone who's applied these rules will let you know it leads to a dark path of disconnection and isolation where we're not, you know, we're not really known by anyone. Not to mention it's created a world full of men uh, with the emotional intelligence of a stick, which is, <laughs> a lot of women will agree with that. <laughs> so last year I wrote a book about these things, an exploration of manhood and, and where our unspoken rules uh, have led us. And I called it Men Wanted for Hazardous Journey, so I wrote it on my fridge. And to promote the book, I filled my fridge with copies of the book and threw some clothes in and a coffee maker, I need an espresso maker, and um, hitchhiked around the country, more than four and a half thousand kilometres, smashing the world record for hitchhiking with a fridge, <laughs> which I didn't even know existed when I started. And so what all of this means is that I am now the world's leading authority on hitchhiking with whiteware. So, <laughs> that's impressive. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but today I want to tell the story behind the story. The other story of the fridge tour. But to do that I'm going to have to break the man code. I'm going to actually have to talk about what was really going on. So, beginning of last year, on my 18th wedding anniversary, my wife asked me to leave. She had um, lived with me through my 20s, <laughs> and I was shit in my 20s, a lot, of, a lot of anger and rage and depression. And she had lived with me in my 30s, as I dealt with a lot of that, but I failed in business on such a grand scale that left our, our family homeless on more than one occasion. So living with me is like being on a roller coaster ride, and she'd had enough. She needed to, to get off the ride. And as a big part of me, totally understood that, because I would have left me years ago, because <laughs> I'm, I'm not awesome to live with. But the, uh, the other part was really struck by this overwhelming sense of shame. And I was really surprised that it was shame that, that hit me. I wasn't expecting that. Because I have failed a lot in my life, more than anyone I know. But, you know, the two things I was never going to fail at was being a husband and being a father. And I, I was failing miserably as a husband. Um, and I also didn't know how a good man should respond to such a request to leave. You know, do I honour that request and just go? Or do I stay and fight for my family, for my kids? I didn't know. Where's the manual? And so I decided that I'd stay and I'd fight for my family. And for six months, we tried. We, we went through a lot of stuff and, and really tried to make it work. And after that six months, I went to the pub with a good mate of mine who I'd talked a lot of this stuff through. Spent a couple of hours there. And by the end of the couple of hours, I was like, you know what? I think she's right. I think our marriage is over. I need to leave. And I'm trying to hold back the emotion, right? Because it's not very manly to cry in a pub. That's, that's in the man code. You can't do that unless you've got a dozen points in you. Then it's okay. But, you know, <laughs> I love you, man. But <laughs> and so I said, but I can't, I can't move out and do the whole one-bedroom apartment thing. I can't move out into a one-bedroom apartment and only see my kids every other weekend. Because that would kill me. That would take me back to anger and rage and depression and would take me further down a road of heavy drinking. And I'd become a man I just wouldn't want my kids to see. So I said, I'm not doing that. that that's off the table. So, and I, I needed to do something, though. I just felt like I needed to get out of Dodge. You know, like, what do I do? I need to get out and just do something wild. Um, so I came up with the idea of hitchhiking. I thought, my book's in print, you know, about to be printed in a couple of weeks, so why don't I go and promote the book um, by hitchhiking? Because if I'm hitchhiking, I have to share my journey with other people. I can't do the whole Lone Ranger thing. I, I need to talk to people. I'm asking them for rides. Um, I need to make it bigger than that too. 
You know, I want to do something stupid. I want to do something extreme. I want to put a giant obstacle in my way. And I'm thinking of something big uh, and something possibly white. You know? <laughs> so we came up with this. And this isn't an original idea. I mean, I got this idea from Tony Hawk's book, Round Island with a Fridge, that he wrote years ago. And he got the idea when he saw some old dude hitchhiking with a fridge. I mean, the idea of hitchhiking with fridges has been around for thousands of years, if you know. <laughs> no, there's nothing new there. And, and, and so I did. On the 1st of November last year, I took my kids to school, uh, kissed them goodbye, and I came home and packed my fridge. And, <laughs> and I left. And for the first three days of the tour, there were many times I was right on the razor's edge of either having a full mental breakdown or, or carrying on. Now, some people might see a man hitchhiking with a fridge as an obvious sign of a mental breakdown. <laughs> but, but I would argue that... What was that? Really? I'm trying to give a talk here. Um, I, I would argue that if you're at home watching four or five hours of television or gaming each night, and you're not out hitchhiking with a fridge, you may have some serious mental health issues. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but sometimes you need to do something mental to stay sane. I think. Um, so, on the road, six weeks I was on the road, and I met hundreds and hundreds of people and had a great time. And the great thing about hitchhiking is quite often when you're in someone's car, the, uh, it becomes like a confession booth. And the stories become very honest and very real very quickly. And so I heard loads of people's stories of where they'd been and what they'd done. And I heard great stories and, and horrifying stories. And people who had also been through separation and divorce. And, and people who had been married 40, 50 years and still happy. And you know, I got the, a bigger picture. And I got to hold up my own journey and look at it and process it and grieve my way through a part of my loss. And one of my favourite stories from the road was this lady picks me up uh, in a little town in the middle of nowhere. And this, you know, we get into a deep conversation very quickly and within a couple of minutes, you know, she's burst into tears. And she says, you know what, half an hour ago I dropped my kids off at my parents' house. And I've been driving down this road looking for a truck to drive head on into. So that's a. But there haven't been any trucks. And then I see you with your smile on the side, on the side of the road with the fridge. And, <laughs> and I have to pick you up. And so for two hours, I, you know, as we drove along, I listened to this, this lady's stories. And that lady's life was saved that day because she had the courage to take her mask off and tell the real story of what was going on. And I was there to listen. And so after six weeks of being on the road, um, I just, I was in a great headspace. I, I shared my story, I'd heard so many stories. And I could now come home and I could be the, the father that my kids needed me to be. I could be the ex-husband that my now ex-wife needed me to be. And all these months later, <laughs> yeah, the one who's not the asshole, I'm, a, I'm an awesome ex-husband. <laughs> I really am. Actual husband, shit. <laughs> ex-husband, awesome. <laughs> But I, I did what I needed to do. I broke the man code. I talked, and I processed, and I grieved. See, us men are really good at some stuff, right? We're really good at like um, dreaming up stuff, and planning, and developing, and blowing shit up. You know, we're really good at that. And backing trailers, and chopping wood, and parallel parking. You know, we're really good at some stuff. <laughs> These are manly things. But some stuff we're just not good at. You know, talking being an example of that. But also like uh, asking for directions. Now many women here will testify to this. That uh, if your man is driving and he's in an unfamiliar country or territory and he's obviously lost and you're sitting there with all the patience of a saint, of course. Uh, <laughs> saying, oh, darling, why don't you please pull over and ask for directions? <laughs> and then he's like, I don't need bloody directions. I know exactly where I'm going. You know, and I've been guilty of this. And he's right. He's a man. He's a man. He doesn't need directions. He'll get there eventually. You know, 38 years later, admittedly, but he'll, he'll get there. And so another thing we're not great at doing is asking for help. So I'm at the pub a couple of weeks ago, and someone's trying to parallel park right in front of the pub, but they are the world's worst parallel parker. And it's like a 600-point turn to get in there. And then out from the driver's seat pops a guy. And we all thought it was a woman driver. And we're going, we're going it's a dude! No. And the whole pub falls into a pit of despair. You know? So someone go grab that guy's man card, because, you know, what the hell is this shit? 
I'm, I'm sure he has strengths in other areas. But. <laughs> but, but the worst thing is that when he comes to leave a little while later, um, all his instincts are backwards. And so everything he's doing is taking him closer and closer to the curb. But even worse yet, there's a post right on the edge of the curb. And he ends up hard up against it, rubbing his car up against it, ruining his panel work. And so at any point, does he get out of the car and come into the pub and ask for help? No. Men don't do that. That would make like world news headlines. Can you imagine it? It'd make, men get, man gets out of car and goes into pub and asks for help getting out of car parking space. It'd be a really long headline. But <laughs> we just don't do that. We don't ask for help. We don't talk about what's really going on. We don't ask for directions in life, and we don't ask for help. We're lone rangers, and it's all very bloody manly. You know, but it's also really lonely. So three years ago, I set up something called Project Wildman, and I didn't know what I was doing. I'm a builder. I just knew that my lone ranger approach had never worked, and that if I was going to get to where I wanted to be in life, I needed to find a tribe of guys and start talking about the real stuff. So we lit a fire in my backyard, and got a bunch of guys together, and we all agreed to take the masks off and tell the real story of who we are and what, what was going on. And it blew us away. Like most guys have never heard other men talk like this. It just it was amazing. And within a short time, other guys started coming, and someone else came along that introduced like a basic structure that was amazing. Then over the last couple of years, we, we set up a charitable trust. And now there's a number of groups that meet weekly in Wellington where guys sit around the fire, take the mask off, and tell the real story. And I even put the manual on how to do that in the back of my book because it's so simple and it's like open source. Just take it and do it. It's so easy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's basic. And so how does, how does all this talking stuff help? You know? I know women know, but for the men here. Um, well, I'm only 40. I don't know very much, which is weird because when I was 16, I knew everything. So I, I don't know what's happened in the last 24 years. <laughs> <laughs> and so I only have this small map that I'm trying to navigate my whole life with, right? The territory is massive, and I've got this tiny little map that's like what I know and what I've seen and what I believe and the, you know, the filters I use. And the man I want to be is over here. And I've got this small map that I can't get there. And the father I want to be is over here. And you know, I've got this small map, and I'm trying to navigate the entire territory. But you see, this guy over here, he's got a different map because he's covered a different part of the territory and by the time you get like 10 guys together you've all got a different part of the map and you can all hold it up and actually look at it and start getting the bigger picture and so I can at, at wild man I can sit around the fire and I can say you know I'm really really struggling I re and a, an actual example from my life is I'm not being the dad I want to be at the moment it's, anger keeps popping up and so at wild man I can I can hold that up and talk about it and one of the you know, the cornerstones of wild man is own your shit. You are where you are today because of you, so don't blame anyone. Own it and get on with it. So I'll hold it up and I'll talk about it and go, man, I'm just, this anger keeps coming up. I'm trying to be this dad and yet this, this keeps happening. And what's great about my group is there's three or four other guys who also have children. So they'll start talking about, you know, what's going on for them and how they're either succeeding or failing. And I can learn from their story. And I, I, get, I get the bigger picture. But it also helps me to realise that I'm not the only one who's an asshole. But <laughs> So oh, you're an asshole as And so I feel better about myself. It's great. <laughs> and so if a wise businessman is, is taking on a new venture, he doesn't do it alone, but he gets his dream team together. He'll get people who have strengths where he's weak and people who know stuff he doesn't know, and he'll get his investors and his mentors, and he'll put it together, create his dream team, and head to you know, and they'll go together and they'll succeed. Why do, why do most businesses fail within the first couple of years? of starting up, the Lone Ranger. It's, it's a, you've got this small map and you're trying to cover the whole territory. It doesn't work. Why do most men, us men, never get to where we actually want to be? The Lone Ranger. Small map, massive territory. It doesn't work. So another reason that talking actually helps is that us as men actually want to connect with other guys. You know, I know it's not manly to say that. Oh. Apologies for that. But we do. Like, what, what's the pub really about? What, what's playing sports really about? We'll play sports or go to the pub with the same guys for 20 years and yet never have a conversation that's deeper than our, our work or sex or sport. It's like we stay here forever. And we want to connect. That's actually why we're there. But we don't. Because we have these spoke, unspoken rules 
that, you know, we don't talk about that stuff. This is what we talk about. And if you ever go here, I'll say, pull your head in, and we'll, we'll just keep it here, please, because this is where I'm comfortable. But we are actually there because we want to connect. And what forming a, a, your own tribe does is it creates a space where you're there to connect. And you can't truly connect with someone else unless you're truly seen. And when we spend our lives hold, hiding behind our masks, I'm the tough guy, I'm the rich guy, I'm the poor guy, I'm the witty guy, and we never allow ourselves to truly be seen, we can never actually truly connect with other people. And so that's what creating this kind of tribe does as well. I'm there and I connect and I get a bigger picture. So so many of us guys actually want to be better men. We want to be better fathers, we want to be better husbands, we want to be better partners, we just don't know how. Now we're never showing. And we're tired of beating ourselves up over every little mistake and failure. And our families are tired of us spewing the disappointment of our lives over all of them with our moodiness and our anger and depression and sulking and, and punishing and blaming. And our partners and our wives and the women in our lives are tired of carrying the load of all that. You know, the, the, a weight that an entire tribe can carry, but one person cannot. And women have been burning themselves out for generations, trying to support us men, trying to rescue us and save us. But we don't need rescuing. And we don't need saving. We need our tribes. So men, we were handed a model of manhood that is broken. It's never worked. So let's burn that model to the ground, have the courage to truly be seen, form our tribes, and start journeying together towards the men we want to be. Thank you.